Good evening. Uh, I'm discussing uh, balance of payment session. This uh, session number eight. Session number eight has two parts. First part is balance of payment, and uh, the second part is about exchange rate uh, related concept. And these are the things we will be discussing in this session. Uh, features of balance of payments, double entry accounting system, uh, the composition of balance of payment, uh, calculation of the overall balance of payment, and finally, national income identity in pay balance. So let's let's uh, see what does it mean by balance of payment. Balance of payment is a statement. The statement. And it summarizes all economic transactions during a period usually one year, analyzes all economic transactions occur between, between residents and non-residents, residents and non-residents. Non-residents are the residents from other countries. There are imports happening between residents and non residents. There are exports happening between residents and non residents. There are direct investments. There are portfolio investments. There are interest payments. There are remittances. Likewise, there are a range of, there is a range of transactions that happen between residents and non residents. Residents means People who reside in uh, the domestic country. Non residents are those who are residing in other countries. So, all of these transactions are summarized in the statement over a period of, uh, over a particular period of time. And that statement is called uh, the balance of payment. Balance of payment. In application, it is BOT. So, an international transaction is an exchange of goods. Yes. So, these are the types of transactions that we report in BOT. Exchange of goods, that means exchange of goods and services, that means exports and imports. Also, uh, there may be, there are, they are up. Asset transactions, asset transactions. A Sri Lankan resident can buy government bonds from Japan, government bonds from uh, the USA. So in return, uh, the Japanese government or the USA government has to pay interest uh, to the uh, resident in Sri Lanka. Likewise, there are asset created, asset created transactions as well. Sometimes uh, Sri Lankan investor can invest in stock market in some in any other country. Likewise, there are asset related, related transactions also, not only goods and services related transactions, there are asset related transactions also. So all these types of transactions are reported in the BOP. It can also be defined as the record of a country's sources and users of foreign exchange. Yes, when the transactions uh, happen between residents and non-residents, always foreign exchange currencies, foreign currencies are exchanged. Foreign currencies are exchanged. So all the transactions happening, uh, the balance of payment are in terms of foreign exchange. Therefore, it's about demand and supply of foreign exchange, foreign currencies. The difference between all money flowing 
into and out of the country during a given period of time. So ultimately, they have reached a balance, and that balance represents uh, the difference between all money flowing into, that means uh, foreign exchange inflows, foreign exchange inflows, and money flowing out of the country, that is about foreign exchange. <laughs> Exchange outflows. So BOP reports for in exchange inflows and outflows during a particular period of time that happened between residents and non residents. That is a basic introduction to uh, the BOP. It records economic transactions systematically. And we use uh, the double entry system for that. In accounting, you learn uh, the double entry system, double entry bookkeeping system. So the same concept is applied here in order to report transactions in uh, the balance of payments. So we use double entry bookkeeping system. So it's a systematic report of economic transactions. We report economic transactions by following double entry bookkeeping system. It reports both visible items that are goods and also invisible items which are services. The usual period is one year. We use the double entry bookkeeping system where every entry uh, to an account, to an account involves a corresponding and opposite entry to another account. So there will be both credit and debit entry. There, there will be two entries. One is credit, and the other entry is debit. Debit. The position will be either at equilibrium or surplus or deficit here. If uh, foreign exchange inflows and outflows are equal, then there will be an equilibrium. When foreign exchange inflows and outflows are the same, there will be an equilibrium. When foreign exchange inflows are greater than foreign exchange outflows, there will be a surplus. There will be a surplus. When foreign exchange inflows is less than foreign exchange outflows, then there will be a deficit. There will be a deficit. So there is a, uh, there is a guideline document, guideline book uh, available for countries in reporting. Uh, to report, uh, to, 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 which provides guidelines uh, to report transactions uh, in terms of foreign exchange. And that is published by uh, the IMA, International Monetary Fund, that is published by the IMA, International Monetary Fund. And that book is called. Uh, the sixth edition, the sixth edition of the IMF's Balance of Payment and International Investment Position Manual. Investment Position Manual, that is the name of it. That manual provides guidelines for countries to report, to report foreign exchange transactions in the balance of payment. So in abbreviation, it is called BPM6. Balance of Payment and International Investment Position Network, the sixth edition published by the IMA. It provides guidelines for uh, compiling consistent, sound, and timely BOP statistics. So, this is important because then all countries will follow the same format, same framework, same guidelines. Same. So, there will be consistent reporting 
uh, followed by each and every country. So this is about a double entry accounting system. The arrangement of literature transactions into a balance of payments account requires that each transaction is entered as a credit entry and a debit entry. So each transaction should have a credit entry and a debit entry. A credit transaction is one that results in a receipt of a payment. When uh, the country receives a foreign exchange inflow, when the country receives a foreign exchange inflow, then it is credited. It is credited. It's about foreign exchange inflows. We report foreign exchange inflows as credit, as a credit entry. And foreign exchange outflows, foreign exchange outflows. We enter as a debit trade, as a debit trade. From Sri Lanka's perspective, so Sri Lanka is the domestic country. Sri Lanka is the domestic country. So from Sri Lanka's perspective, from the perspective of the domestic country, the following transactions are credit. So the credit transactions are these. These are uh, some examples of credit transactions, uh, which represent receipt of foreign exchange or foreign exchange inflows. Merchandise exports. So when we export something abroad, we receive a payment for that. So it's a it's an inflow. Transportation and travel receipt. So when uh, Sri Lanka Sri Lanka airline provides uh, service to foreigners, foreigners have to pay. Uh, payments in foreign exchange to Sri Lanka. So that is also a receipt of foreign exchange, an inflow of foreign exchange. Income received from investments abroad. So when an investor, a Sri Lankan investor invests abroad, there will be an interest payment for the Sri Lankan investor. That is also an inflow. So it's a credit transaction. Gifts received from foreign residents. Yes, that is also a receipt. It's uh, reported as a credit transaction. Aid record, uh, received from foreign governments. Yes, some uh, governments provide aid to Sri Lanka. So those are also reported as uh, credit transactions. Investment in Sri Lanka by overseas residents, specific, specifically foreign direct investors, FDIs. When uh, a foreign investor uh, brings FDI into Sri Lanka, that is also a credit transaction because there will be, a, uh, there will be an inflow of foreign exchange. So these are several examples of some examples of credit transactions and credit transactions are about foreign exchange inflows, foreign exchange inflows. And these are the uh, debit transactions which represent uh, foreign exchange outflows from Sri Lanka to other countries. Merchandise imports, yes, there will be a foreign exchange outflow. Transportation and travel expenditures spent by Sri Lankans in other countries. So, for example, if a Sri Lankan citizen, if a Sri Lankan resident uh, uses uh, Emirates, a Sri Lankan resident has to pay foreign exchange to Emirates. So it's an in, it's an outflow. So uh, transportation and travel expenditures spent. Uh, by Sri Lankan residents uh, abroad or in spent by Sri Lankan residents abroad for uh, in foreign firms. So that is also considered as a credit transaction, sorry, debit transaction, because there will be a uh, foreign exchange outflow. Income paid on uh, the investment of foreigners. So sometimes foreigners also can 
uh, invest in Sri Lanka. So Sri Lankan uh, firms have to pay interest payments to foreigners. So it's a uh, foreign exchange outflow. In that sense, it's also going to be a debit transaction. Gifts to foreign residents, yes, there will be an in outflow. There will be an outflow. It's a debit transaction. Aid given by Sri Lankan government to other countries, it's an outflow. It's a debit transaction. Overseas investment by Sri Lankan residents. When Sri Lankan residents uh, bring FDI to other countries, that is uh, foreign, that is an outflow. So it's going to be a debit transaction. So these are several examples. Some examples for debit transactions. They are debit transactions because uh, they are uh, foreign exchange outflows from Sri Lanka to other countries. So we consider an example here. Every transaction, every international transaction involves an exchange of assets or products. Uh, and so has both a credit and debit side. Has both credit and debit side. Each credit entry is balanced by a debit entry. Yes, when there is a credit entry with the same amount. By the same amount, there should be a debit entry and vice versa. So that uh, the recording of any international transaction leads to two offsetting entries. One example is consider a Sri Lankan spice exporter, Sri Lankan spice exporter exports. This much of spices, this much worth of spices to a German importer. So, what kind of a transaction is this? It's basically a credit uh, transaction. It's a credit transaction. Because there will be a foreign exchange inflow. There will be a foreign exchange inflow. So it's basically credit transaction. So the first transaction, uh, the first entry should be credit. First entry should be credited. Current account is the account where such transactions are reported. So goods and services, exports and imports are reported in current account. So current account is credited. Current account is credited. So we will learn what is the meaning of current account later. For the moment, just understand that. Uh, exports of goods and services are reported in the current account. So current account has to be printed under good sex. So it's a positive value of USD 25 million rupees. 25 million USD. And next, the financial account should be debited. Financial account should be debited. So there will be an increase in foreign assets or receivables. There will be an increase in foreign assets or receivables. Let's say uh, the Sri Lankan, uh, the, the German importer imports uh, spices on credit. So there will be uh, an, uh, an asset created as a receivable, as a receivable. So that amount is debited minus 25 million USD. The export of spices worth of uh, 25 million USD is recorded as a credit in the current account under goods exports, under goods exports in current account. This is because Sri Lanka is receiving foreign currency. Yes, there will be uh, an inflow of foreign currency. There will be an inflow of foreign exchange. Sri Lanka receives. Sri Lankan resident who is uh, the, the exporter receives foreign exchange, so it's going to be uh, a credit transaction. In exchange for the Pfizer SIC exports, the corresponding debit entry would be recorded in the financial account, financial account to reflect the financial transaction associated with the export. Typically, this would show up as an increase in Sri Lanka's foreign currency reserves yes, because of this. Because of this uh, income received by Sri Lanka in exported, Sri Lanka receives foreign exchange. Sri Lanka receives foreign exchange, and it adds to it is added to foreign currency reserves. Foreign currency reserves as a receivable, as a receivable from German 
imported. That is why the financial account is limited. And the second example is a Sri Lankan resident who owns bonds. Sri Lankan resident who owns bonds issued by the US company, issued by a US company, receive interest payments of uh, USD 10,000. So resident is a Sri Lankan, so it's an inflow. It's an inflow of foreign exchange from the US to Sri Lanka. Foreign exchange inflow. It's a foreign exchange inflow. So it's also kind of a credit transaction. It's basically a credit transaction. So the current account is debt debitor. These kind of interest payments and interest uh, receives, receipts are also reported in the current account. It's also reported in the current account under the primary income account. Under the primary income account, you will learn what is the meaning of primary income account later. For the moment, just understand that interest payments are reported in the primary income account. It's an investment income. So it's credited. It's credited by USD 10,000. And where it is debited is uh, the financial account. It increases foreign assets or it increases foreign receivables so that it is debited. Uh, the receipt of interest payments from abroad, interest payment from abroad is recorded as a credit in the current account under primary income, under primary income. Uh, investment income is a part of primary income. Investment income is a part of primary income. This reflects that, this reflects the inflow of foreign currency into Sri Lanka due to the interest income. The corresponding debt entry, uh, debit entry, uh, would be reported in uh, the financial account to reflect the increase in Sri Lanka's foreign currency assets or receivables. This might uh, show up as an increase in uh, Sri Lankan banks deposits or receivables. It's going to be the financial asset uh, to Sri Lanka. The foreign currency received by this Sri Lankan investor is kind of a foreign currency asset. Therefore, it is debited in financial account. So this is uh, the basic structure of BOP. Basically, it has two accounts, current and capital account and the financial account. So here we have again current account and capital account. Basically, there are three current account, capital account, and financial account. Current account, capital account, and uh, the financial account. Usually these two accounts are uh, reported together. We show current account and capital account together and financial account separate. If you observe uh, the central bank annual reports, you see the current account and capital account details are summarized in one table. Financial account details are summarized in another table. So that is why we have this kind of categorization. First we have current and capital accounts, and then we have uh, financial account. Current and capital accounts are two separate accounts. So altogether, basically, there are three. There are three basic accounts, but the report, when, when it comes to uh, fire, the, the reporting side, current account and capital account are reported together. So current account has four accounts. Current account has four sub accounts. The first one is trade in goods. Trade in goods, the physical items, physical item, trade of physical item, that is uh, goods exports and goods imports. This account does not report any transaction happened in terms of services. So it's only about physical goods, physical goods, tangible goods, tangible goods. When it comes to uh, service exports and service imports, they are reported in services account, service exports and service imports.
these two items together, goods exports and services exports, are called simply exports. Exports. Goods imports and service imports. Goods imports and service imports are called imports. Imports. So export has two sides: goods exports and service exports. Imports also has uh, two sides, goods imports and service imports. But goods transactions are reported in one account, service transactions are service related transactions are reported in another account. Export, exports are uh, receipts or inflows imports are outflows of fine uh, of foreign exchange exports uh, represent foreign exchange inflows to country imports represent foreign exchange outflows from the country to other country so what is the difference between export and import Export minus import, outflows, sorry, inflows minus outflows. Goods and services imports, sorry, goods and services exports minus goods and services imports. What does it, what do we call, how do we call it? We learned it in the previous session. It's net exports, it's net export. Also, we call it as the trade balance. Trade balance in national accounting. In national accounting, there is a concept called trade balance. Trade balance is simply the net exports. That is the difference between export and imports. Exports and imports. But don't get confused that in balance of payment, in balance of payment, trade balances, trade balances. The balance in the trade account, trade in goods only. In, in balance of payment, trade balances, trade balances, goods and goods exports minus goods imports. So, in balance of payment, the concept of trade balance is restricted to goods exports and goods imports. Goods imports. But when it comes to national account, national accounting, when it comes to national accounting, trade balances, uh, the difference between goods and services exports and minus goods and services imports. In BOP account, in BOP account, trade balances, goods exports minus goods imports. So that is the difference. But in generally, in national accounting, Trade balances, goods and services exports, minus goods and services imports. In BOP, trade balances, goods export minus goods import. There is no services. There are no services. So the balancing, balance of the trade in goods account. Balance of the trade account is called the trade balance. So there is a difference. Uh, like this. There is a difference in national accounting framework and in BOP framework. And apart from these two accounts, trade in goods and trade in services, we have two other accounts, primary income. And secondary income. Primary income are for uh, the income receipts and income payments related to factors of income, fa factors of production for labor, for uh, capital, for land, for such items. Sometimes residents receive income, sometimes residents have to pay uh, factors, uh, factory income to other countries. So those transactions are reported in. Primary income account. 
secondary income account is something else. Something else. Uh, remittances. Basically, uh, remittances from foreign workers are reported in secondary income account. But it is simply labor. It's, a, it's simply a labor income, right? Foreign remittances. Uh, the housemates uh, uh, working uh, Middle East, in the Middle East, they send money to Sri Lanka. So it's for their labor. It's the income for their labor. So according to the definition, that labor income should be reported in, should be reported in primary income account. But we don't report remittances in primary income account. Instead, we report them in secondary income account. Why is that? Why is that? Because long-term uh, foreign workers, long-term foreign workers, even though they are citizens of the country, even though they are citizens of the country, they are no longer residents. If uh, a woman uh, is working, if a Sri Lankan woman is working in uh, the Middle East, she is, of course, a Sri Lankan citizen, but she is a long term worker. She's a long term worker, so that she is no longer a resident. She is no longer a resident in Sri Lanka according to the laws and regulations. That is a law, I think. Anyway, there is the law that. Uh, specifies after which period a foreign worker is not considered as a resident. I think after six months, after six months, after six months, even though uh, he or she is a Sri Lankan citizen, if they are working abroad over six years, over a period of six years, that person is not considered as a resident. In law also, in, in uh, taxation also, that may be applied, right? Are you doing taxation? Is that rule applied in taxation? No. Six months, yes, yes. After six months, the person is, even though he is or she is a resident, is citizen, she is no longer, or she or he is no longer a resident. So primary income is about uh, primary income is about income receipts by residents. Income receipts by residents. So if I'm going to work in a foreign company only for five months or four months. Then that income will be reported in primary income account because I'm still, I'm still a resident because my work contract is limited to five months or six months. It's below six months, five months or four months, it's below six months. So if I'm working, if someone is working abroad, uh, for a period below six months, for a period below six months, that person is still a resident. Therefore, uh, the remittances coming from that person is reported in primary income account. The remittances uh, received from workers who are working abroad over six months, over six months, that is reported in secondary income because those persons are no longer residents of the country even though they are citizens. So there is a difference between the concept of citizenship and residency. So law marks the boundary of residency. If someone is working abroad uh, beyond six months, beyond six months, that person is no longer a resident. So primary income account reports only income receipts of residents only. So this is uh, the summary of balance of payment of current account and capital account. Current account and capital account. In 2000, uh, 2022 and 2023, this was extracted, extracted from uh, the annual economic review 2023, published by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Uh, from this year onward, uh, Central Bank of Sri Lanka publishes a separate report, Annual Economic Review 2023. Earlier, 
the economic preview of the country is also incorporated in the annual report of Central Bank of Sri Lanka. It's a very uh, big uh, publication. But from this year onwards, they, they have two separate publications. One is annual economic review, and the other one is, I think, they are in internal financial matters reported in the, in the annual report. Annual report and uh, annual economic review, they are two publications from this time onwards. Annual report, PBS death. Before, uh, from, before 2023, sorry, before this year, before this year, there was only one publication, that is annual report 2023. It includes the economic overview in different chapters, economic overview in different chapters and afterwards the internal financial matters are reported in uh, the annual report text part. Accounts and operations of the central bank, they were reported in part two. So both, they are account details, and economic review both were mentioned in one report and that is called that was called the annual report of central bank of sri lanka but from this time onwards uh, for the year 2023 they are publishing two reports one is financial uh, annual economic review which covers uh, the economic operations uh, economic uh, reviews of the country and the other part is financial statements and operations. So there are two reports from this time onwards. And those reports were published uh, very uh, recently uh, for the year 2023. So there is a change now. Earlier, both of these parts, both of these sections were in the annual report. Now they have they are publishing two reports. One is financial uh, annual economic review, and the other one is financial statements and operations. So this is this was extracted from uh, the annual economic review 2023 uh, published by the CTSL. So you see, first we have the current account. Current account has uh, four sub accounts: trade account, trade account, and its balance is called the trade balance. It is about goods exports and goods imports. That is not the, uh, the usual trade balance concept we learn in uh, the national account. And next we have services, service receipts and uh, service payment receipts and service payment uh, payments abroad. And it's net. So these are the balances. These are the balances. And then we have primary income balance. Secondary income, it's balanced. And then uh, the overall balance of the current account. Overall balance of the current account. And finally, we have the capital account. Capital account balance. So, uh, 
2023 is a remar remarkable year because after many years, the current account reports a surplus. Current account reports a surplus. Before that, in many years, current account reported uh, deficits. You see here, the current account balance is shown in this uh, blue color line. So in 2023, it reports a surplus, but before that, in every year, there was a deficit. There was a deficit. So 2023 is a remarkable year because it reports a current account surplus in Sri Lanka after many years. And it uh, there, there is that surplus because you see there is a, a considerable increase in uh, worker remittances. Worker remittances has have increased significantly. As you can remember during the crisis and during uh, the, the anti-government protest period, uh, many uh, the citizens, Sri Lankan citizens who are working abroad, they didn't send remittances to Sri Lanka. They purposefully uh, stopped sending remittances to Sri Lanka and also they, they were sent to informal channels. So when uh, foreign exchange is sent to Sri Lanka through informal channels, they are not reported in uh, balance of payment. So there was a huge decrease in foreign remittances during 2020, 2021 and 2022 period. And now it's getting recovered. Now it has get, it got recovered. Now people are sending money. So that's why we have this sharp increase in foreign worker evidence. And also there is a significant increase in service receipts, service receipts because mainly because of tourist arrivals during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and during uh, the crisis period, during the anti-government protest period. Uh, tourist arrivals dropped sharply. Now they have recovered. Tourists are coming to Sri Lanka and their arrivals have increased. So tourist arrivals have increased. Tourist arrivals have increased. From 3,000 million USD, 3,000 million USD to 5,000 million USD pounds. Uh, imports also have reduced. Imports also have reduced. So these are the factors uh, that cause for this surplus. That cause for this surplus in balance account, uh, in the current account after many years. Uh, the external current account recorded a surplus of US uh, of one thousand five hundred and fifty nine million USD in 2023 compared to a deficit of uh, 1,448 uh, USD million in 2022. The surplus were mainly driven by lower trade deficit. Yes, trade deficit is lower. Usually uh, every year Sri Lanka reports a trade uh, deficit because always Sri Lanka uh, imports goods more than uh, goods exports. In Sri Lanka, goods export is less than goods imports. So many uh, necessary items like crude oil, uh, sometimes sugar, flour, uh, and many other consumables are imported to Sri Lanka. Domestic production is low. Such uh, items are not domestically produced in uh, sufficient levels. So Sri Lanka has to import those items to Sri Lanka. So always goods export is lower than goods imports. Therefore, in Sri Lanka, in all years, in almost all years, Sri Lanka reports a trade deficit. Trade balance is negative. A trade deficit is there in every year. So that is reported in this by this light, uh, the pink color, this area. This area shows 
the trade deficit it's always negative except yes it's always negative it's always negative but that deficit but deficit has shrinked the deficit has shrinked in 2022 that is also uh, one reason for this uh, current account surplus current account surplus lower trade deficit is one factor behind this surplus in uh, the current account and also improved trade in services yes as i said tourism increased tourist arrivals is another reason for this surplus in current account and the other one is higher surplus in the secondary income account mainly because of uh, increased worker evidence worker evidence so those are the three main reasons behind uh, the, the, the positive or the surplus in the current account in 2023 after many years this has happened uh, the, the current account is reporting uh, current account has reported a surplus after many years when it comes to the trade account trade account it's about goods exports and goods imports so this picture or this image shows goods exports in sri lanka so what is the major uh, export earning industry in sri lanka it's textile and garment textile and garment is uh, the single uh, industry that generates the largest uh, foreign exchange revenue to sri lanka you can see it's a very considerable amount it's a very big amount compared to other industries and next e comes next rubber products comes and then machinery and uh, mechanical appliances so these are the main uh, three or four uh, industries that generate the largest foreign exchange to sri lanka from shoe exports so we can categorize these exports into three uh, industrial goods agricultural goods and mineral and other goods uh, textile and garments come under industrial goods uh, tea rubber products come under agricultural goods and we have mineral mineral and other yes. gems diamonds and jewelry should come under mineral goods and there are other categories as well so which which uh, which category uh, contributes a significant the, the largest contribution is coming from which industry which category industrial category the largest uh, export revenue is generated from industrial goods industrial goods because textile and garment is coming under industrial goods textile and garment is the single industry that generates the largest export revenue to sri lanka therefore uh industrial good category generates the largest portion of export revenue to sri lanka which is around 77% 77% that's about goods exports the next figure is about goods imports goods imports as i told you earlier a trade account has two parts a trade account reports both goods exports and goods imports this picture is about goods exports and the next picture is which is about goods uh, imports but in the single large the single largest industry uh, in terms of imports that is oil oil and also uh, textile and textile articles even though uh, the garment industry generates the largest uh, export revenue to sri lanka the garment industry the textile industry mainly depends on imported raw material sri lankan garment industry imports uh, a lot of inputs from, from abroad as a result garment and textile related imports also represent a considerable amount considerable amount machinery and equipment 
is the third large third largest import category and chemical products building materials medical and pharmaceutical items uh, sugar paper vegetables wheat and maize cereals mining industry products there are uh, several other categories as well and we can categorize these items into three consumer goods intermediate goods and investment and other goods the largest portion is coming from consumer goods consumer goods because oil should come under that oil should come under that category uh, the mercantile trade deficit for 2023 reached its lowest level in uh, 2010 largely driven by a notable decline in since 2010 yes trade deficit for 2023 reached its lowest level after 2023 after 22 sorry after 2010 uh, 2010 largely driven by a notable decline in import expenditure import expenditure that has reduced sharply that's why uh, the trade deficit has narrowed. Trade deficit has shrinked because there are many trade uh, import restrictions in Sri Lanka. Government imposed many trade res uh, import restrictions. Automobiles imports were restricted, and there were some other restrictions uh, of imports uh, during 2023. That's why trade deficit shrinked. The surplus in the service account reported uh, a notable increase in 2023, mainly because of tourism. Tourism. Deficit in the primary income account widened in 2023. Uh, primary income account reports the interest payments for government loans, government debt. Uh, for government debt, government has to pay interest payments. So, because of higher interest payments, primary income account uh, deficit widened. You can see primary income account the payments interest payments payments have increased. Payments have increased because of interest payments. Interest payments. For government debt. As a result, uh, the deficit in primary income account has widened. Deficit has widened. It was uh, 1,870 minus 1,870 in 2022. It has widened. The deficit has widened in 2023 and it was minus 2,564. That was because of interest payments. The surplus in the secondary income account increased in 2023 with continuous improvement in worker return. Okay. Let's look at uh, each and every account in DOP one by one. The first account is trading goods. This category includes exports and imports of goods only. Export comprises of uh, agricultural exports, industrial exports, and mineral and other exports, as we saw in the figures. Import includes uh, consumer goods, intermediate goods, and investment and other goods, as I showed you in the figure. And the second item in the current account is trading services, uh, income receipts and income payment payments or related to transportation, traveling, computer services, construction services are reported in this account. So that is mainly about uh, imports and exports of services. The third item is the current account in uh, the, the uh, third item in the Current account is primary income, which includes mainly interest payments on debt and securities and dividend payments on portfolio. 
The fourth item is secondary income and it comprises worker remittances and general government transfers. Capital transfers. The, the capital account is the, the next account is capital account. After the current account, the next account is capital account. Capital account reports two types of transactions. One is capital transfers. They are in terms of uh, investments, investments, and debt forgiveness. If if a country, if a foreign country has given a loan to Sri Lankan government, and if that foreign country cuts the loan, that is kind of a debt for forgiveness. Debt forgiveness, and those kind of debt forgiveness are reported in capital account under capital transfers. It's kind of a capital transfer. Even though it, the debt is cut, it's uh, a capital transfer in nature, so that's why it is important in uh, the capital transfers, a capital account as capital transfer. An acquisition disposal of, disposal of non produced non financial assets. So, what are these? Non produced non financial assets. What are these? They include patents, they include trademarks, such things. They are non produced. They are not goods, they are not services, and also they are not non-financial. They are not financial assets. There are four uh, items like patents, copyrights, trademarks, franchises, leases, these uh, acquisitions and uh, disposals are reported in uh, the capital account. This category includes the purchase or sale of intangible assets such as patents, copyrights, trademarks, franchises, and leases, as well as uh, the acquisition or disposal of natural resources. The third account in BOP is financial account and it records transactions that involve financial assets and liabilities between residents and non residents of an economy. These transactions are categorized by type. So, uh, for indirect investment, direct investment, portfolio investment. Financial derivatives, other investment and reserve assets. So these are the items that come under the financial account. Financial account is essential uh, for understanding how an economy finances its investment operations and how it interacts financially with the rest of the world. It provides detailed information on the nature of financial transactions and the changes in ownership for financial. So this is about financial assets and liabilities. So financial assets and liabilities are reported. Uh, the, the transaction related to financial assets and transactions related to financial assets and liabilities are reported in the financial account. And they are mainly direct investment, portfolio investment, financial derivatives, other investment and reserve assets. Financial account also has reported a uh, surplus in 2023. Why is that? What is the main reason? You should know that. Because Sri Lanka received IMF loan, World Bank loan, ADB loan. So they came to Sri Lanka, they were receipts to Sri Lanka, they were in terms of financial liabilities. They were financial liabilities. So that's why uh, the financial account has reported a surplus in Sri Lanka. Both the net incurrence of liabilities and net acquisition of financial assets recorded a notable increase during 2023. Main inflows to the financial account during 2023 included the receipt of the proceeds uh, of the IMF EMF arrangement and uh, the receipts from the World Bank and ADP. So you don't have to uh, memorize all these figures, all these facts. You don't have to memorize numbers. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to check that knowledge because anyone can uh, refer uh, the central bank report and get these details very quickly on the internet. So I'm not going to check uh, the technical details like the numbers. But you have to remember the composition. You should have some sort of understanding on this composition.
I will ask, I will give you a list of transactions. You should be able to categorize them. To which, in which account this transaction is reported. The question will come like this. It come like that. I talk about if I uh, give you an item called uh, item as an export, you should uh, export of goods, export of let's say spices. You should understand that it is reported in trade account. It is reported in trade account. And I give you an item about worker evidences. You should understand that it is reported in secondary income. Secondary income. So that kind of knowledge will be tested in the exam. I'm not going to check these numbers, okay? I'm not going to ask why there is a surplus in the current account in 2023. Such questions will not come in the examination. Okay. Uh, by taking, there are three accounts current account, uh, capital account, and financial account. They have their own balances. They have their own balances current account balance, capital account balance, and financial account balance. By summing, summing up them, by taking the summation of them, we can't calculate the overall BOP balance. We can't calculate the overall BOP balance. We can't calculate the overall BOP balance by taking the summation of balance of the current account, balance of the capital account, and balance of the financial account. That is wrong, according to BOP manual. We should have a separate method to calculate the overall balance of BOP according to BOP 6th uh, edition, BOP manual 6th edition. And that method is discussed here. With the adoption of BPM6, the overall balance can only be, only be calculated uh, from the change in net international reserve. Changing net international reserves. Change in net international reserves. And you can calculate it in this way. Overall balance equals, overall balance equals change in net international reserves. And how to get the change in net international reserves? Net reserve asset position at the end of the period. At the end of the period, if it is 2023, net reserve asset position at the end of 2023 minus net reserve asset position at the beginning of the period, that is maybe December 2022. This is December 2023. This is December 2022. So we have to get the difference between these two values net reserve asset position at the end of the period maybe in uh, december 2023 minus net reserve asset position at the beginning of the period that is uh, the previous year 2022 december 2022 the net reserve asset position is defined as the difference between uh, the reserve asset position and the reserve related liability position. So this net international reserve is what? Net international reserve is the difference between reserve asset position and liability position, reserve related liability position. So reserve assets, reserve assets, assets minus Reserve related liabilities. Reserve related liabilities. Reserve assets minus reserve related liabilities is net international reserve. 
get the international service for reserve assets minus reserves related liability. And the overall balance is the change in net international reserves. Change in net international reserves. So let's see how Sri Lanka calculated it, calculates it uh, for three years, for the last three years. The data is given in this table. So we have reserve assets, government foreign assets. Central Bank foreign assets. The summation of government foreign assets and central bank foreign assets are considered as gross official reserves. That is the summation of one plus one, the first item and the second item. And then that is official because it belongs to the government and central bank. That is official because these assets are related to government and uh, the central bank. That's why we label it as official. So gross official reserves is the summation of government foreign assets and central bank foreign assets. And the fourth item is foreign assets of deposit taking corporations like the commercial banks. Commercial banks also hold foreign assets. So the fourth item is about that. About that. And the total foreign asset is three plus four official reserves plus foreign assets held by held by a deposit taking corporation. So that is about total foreign assets. So foreign assets are held by whom? Government, central bank, and deposit taking corporations like uh, commercial banks. So th those are the three parties that hold foreign assets. Uh, the total foreign assets held by uh, those three parties are called the total foreign assets. Total foreign assets. And then we have reserve related liabilities. Reserve related liabilities, as I told you earlier, net, net international reserve is what? The difference between reserve assets and reserve related liabilities. We have reserve assets from one hand, we have reserve related liabilities on the other hand. The difference is net international reserves. Net international reserves. So, Net international reserve is six minus, sorry, three minus six. Three minus six. Three minus six. Yes. To calculate net uh, international reserves, we don't consider. We don't consider uh, the foreign assets of deposit taking corporation. So net international reserve is of, uh, only about the government side, uh, the official side. So net international reserve is six minus three minus six. Three is gross official reserves. Six is reserve related liabilities. So that difference is called net international reserves. And the overall balance is what? Overall balance we defined earlier. Change in net international reserve from one period to the other period. So for that, how do we calculate it? Net international reserve position at the end of the period. Let's say we are going to calculate the overall balance. We are going to calculate the overall balance for 2023. So at the end of 2023, what is net international reserve position? NIR position at the end of 2023 is this much. This much. We have to subtract. We have to subtract net to international reserve position at the beginning of the period, at the beginning of 2023. What is that? That is 3000 minus 3229. So by the definition, Overall balance is net fiscal asset position at the end of period. If it is, if we are talking about 2023, that is net reserve asset position at the end of 2023. How much is it? It is 
minus 4004 minus 4004 nir position at the end of uh, the period under consideration which is 2023 is minus 4004 minus 4004 we have to subtract we have to subtract net reserve asset position at the beginning of the period that is that is net reserve asset position at the beginning of the period that means at the end of 2023 at the end of 2023 that amount is minus 3229 we have to subtract minus 3229 from minus 404 and the result is minus 200 and uh, minus 2806 minus 2806 sorry it's positive it's positive make this correction because minus 404 minus minus 3229 so this minus into minus becomes positive and the overall balance becomes a plus a positive value so it's positive it's positive so that is the overall balance in 2023 so that is how the overall balance is calculated according to uh, balance of payment manual the sixth edition you don't want to memorize you don't have to memorize these items uh, but you have to memorize this simple formula overall balance is calculated by taking uh, the change in net interest reserves and that is calculated in this way if i give some uh, values like net internal position in uh, at the end of 2023 is this much net internal uh, reserve position at the end of 2023 is this much you should be able to calculate the overall balance. You simply have to memorize this formula of calculating this formula for calculating the overall balance of EOP. Okay. Uh, we can link uh, the balance of payment concepts to national accounting concept. We can link balance of payment concepts to national accounting concept. That is what I have done here. Uh, you should have learned uh, the national accounting identity in principles of economics course. Have you learned it? I equals C plus I plus G plus X minus M, X minus I. Have you learned it? That is called national income identity. It is an identity because it's always true. It's always true. Why is uh, national income, national income, real national income? Real national income. C is consumption. I is investment, G is government purchases, NX is net exports, that is export minus imports, export minus imports. According to natural accounting, this is the trade balance, this is the trade balance. But, in, uh, but according to uh, balance of payment, that is a trade balance in uh, balance of payment, but this trade balance and that trade balance are different, okay? In BOB, it's only about goods export minus goods imports. It's only about goods exports and goods import, but in national accounting, trade balance is uh, both about goods and services, export minus import. So that is the difference. 
So net exports is export minus import. Also, we call it the trade balance. So by doing the simple modification to this national length of accounting identity, I can derive this expression. Simply what I have done is I have I have made net export as the subject of this new expression. Net export is the subject in this expression by simply changing the, the terms, the position of the terms. So why is here? I bring C to the left, I to the left, G to the left, then only NX will be uh, left on the right hand side by minus G, minus I, minus G. I bring C to the left, I to the left, G to the left, then it is Y minus C minus uh, I minus G. But it's on the right hand side, only N X. N X is of this, the only part, only component which is on the right hand side. So it is simply uh, N X, N X, equals y minus c minus i minus g. So the same thing here, I can rewrite it as y minus, I open the bracket and I put c plus i plus g within the bracket, within the brackets. So that is what I have written Nx equals y minus open bracket. C plus I plus G close the bracket. NX is net exports. Y is the output or the real national income. Real means it's about physical output. Real in the sense we have removed uh, the inflationary effects, so it's simply about the output. That is why real national income is also labeled as output. So, so it's Y is output and this. Three components, C, I, and G, are labeled as domestic spending. Domestic spending. So we have net exports, output, and domestic spending. Domestic spending. So I do, I introduce a, another modification to this expression. I write Y, C, G together and I keep I separately. So if I extend this, it is Y minus T minus I minus G. I, I separate this minus I and I write C, Y, C, and G together. That is what I have done here. Y minus C minus G minus I. Minus I. So this Y minus C minus G can be written as S. S stands for national savings. SC is national savings. National savings. I is investment. I is investment. So the difference between national saving and investment, difference between national saving and investment, that is S minus I equals to net exports, equals to net exports. Net, net exports equals Y minus C minus G minus I. Together, Y minus C minus G is S. It stands for national savings. S minus I. I stands for investment. So S minus I, national savings minus investment equals to net exports according to national accounting identity. So net exports equals national savings minus investment. National savings minus investment, we can give a single term for that, that is net capital outflow. Net capital outflow. We have some savings in the country. 
savings, we have savings in the country. Uh, and investment is this much. Investment is this much. Savings is utilized for investment. Savings is utilized for investment. This is savings, this is investment. So savings is a larger amount compared to investment. So after utilizing savings for investment, there will be some excess. There will be some excess. After utilizing savings in investment for investment, there will be some excess. There will be some excess. That excess amount, that excess amount is lent, is lent abroad. Is lent to foreign countries. As loans, as loans. There is some excess saving amount. After spending for investment, there is some excess saving amount. And that excess saving amount is lent, lent. To foreign countries. To foreign countries. That is net capital outflow. Net capital outflow is positive in that sense. Net capital outflow is positive in that sense. So what these foreign countries can do with that amount? What these foreign countries can do with that amount? They borrow. They borrow. They borrow from us. This is, if this is Sri Lanka. Foreign countries have borrowed. From Sri Lanka. What foreign countries can do with that amount they have borrowed from Sri Lanka? They can import goods and services from Sri Lanka. They can import goods and services from Sri Lanka because they have some amount. They have borrowed some amount. They have money now. They have money now. Foreign countries have money now because they have borrowed from Sri Lanka. So using that amount they have borrowed what foreign countries can do is they can import, they can import goods and services from Sri Lanka. They can import, this is Sri Lanka, they can import goods and services from Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka's exports will be higher, will be will go up. Therefore, net exports also will improve, will be positive. When that capital outflow is positive, by the same amount. By the same amount, net export also will go up. When net capital outflow increases by the same amount, net export also will increase. That is the rationale. Net capital outflow means when it is positive, when it is positive, savings is greater than investment. Saving is greater than investment. That means there is some there is, there is some excess saving. There is some excess saving in the country, in Sri Lanka. So, Sri Lankan citizens can lend, can lend that excess saving to foreign countries. So, foreign countries borrow from Sri Lanka. So, that amount foreign countries borrowed from Sri Lanka can be used to, can be used to import goods and services from Sri Lanka. That means, Sri Lanka's exports go up. Sri Lanka's exports go up. That is why when there is an increase in net capital outflow, export, net exports also, net export also go up. What happens if the opposite happens? What happens when saving is less than investment? What happens when saving is less than investment? Saving is this much in Sri Lanka. Investment is this much. This is Sri Lanka. Saving is not enough, not sufficient to cover investment. Saving amount is not sufficient to cover investment. Then what Sri Lanka has to do? 
Sri Lanka has to borrow from abroad. Foreign countries will lend to Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka borrows from foreign countries. Then they can, then Sri Lanka can. This amount of investment can be fulfilled through uh, national savings, and this amount will be borrowed from Sri Lanka, from other countries. Will be borrowed from other countries. Now Sri Lanka has money. Now Sri Lanka has money. What Sri Lanka can do? Sri Lanka can do. Sri Lanka can import. Sri Lanka can import goods and services from other countries, from foreign countries. So import to Sri Lanka will increase. Import to Sri Lanka will increase. Saving is less than I. That means net capital outflow is negative. When uh, saving is less than I, Sri Lanka has to borrow from other countries. Borrow from other countries. So Sri Lanka will have some amount of foreign money, foreign currency. With that foreign currency, Sri Lankans can import from foreign countries. So imports will go up. Imports will go up. Net export will report a negative value because net export is export minus imports. When imports go up, net export will be negative. So when there is uh, a decrease in net capital outflow, net export value also will decrease. When there is a decrease in net capital outflow, net export also will decrease. So that kind of a positive relationship, a perfect positive relationship, one-to-one -one relationship is there, one-to-one -one relationship is there between net export and net capital inflow or outflow. Net capital inflow, outflow. So this is, when S E is less than I, it is going to be a net capital outflow because foreign countries borrow to Sri Lanka, foreign countries lend to Sri Lanka. So if net capital outflow is positive, it's simply net capital outflow because funds from funds move from Sri Lanka to other countries. If net capital outflow is negative, then it is net cap it is a net capital inflow because funds come from other countries to Sri Lanka. So that is how we can interpret, how we can define the relationship between the exact relationship, the one-to-one -one relationship between net export and net capital outflow according to uh, the national accounting identity. That is clear from this figure. This data is from Sri Lanka over the period from 1962 to 2022. And the blue colored line shows net capital outflow as a percentage of GDP. Uh, the red colored line shows net exports as a percentage of GDP. You see both go hand in hand. Both behave together. When uh, net export, net capital outflow decreases, Net export also decreases. When net capital outflow increases, net export also increases. It is clear during other periods as well. Even though there is a gap, because that is the model. This is the model. This is the model. But when it comes to real world, real world picture is so complex. Real world picture is so complex. The theoretical base is this. But there are many other factors that affect uh, net export, that affect net capital outflow. So in real world, they are not exactly the same. The theory says they are exactly the same. Net export is exactly the same to net capital outflow. That is the theory. But when it comes to the real world, real world picture is so complex. That's why they are not 100% the same amount. But according to the theoretical argument, you can see the two concepts behave together. The two concepts behave together. There is a positive relationship. When one amount increases, the other amount is also increasing. When one amount decreases, the other amount is also decreasing. Likewise, there is a positive relationship, a clear positive relationship, which is clear from this data. You have to understand that, you have to understand this relationship. You don't have to uh, memorize uh, the derivation part, but this relationship, this relationship, you have to memorize. 
la que nos dará esto. This is enough for you. I will skip this part to look at what the product is. Okay. Let's have a five minute break. We have only three hours today. Uh, so let's have a five minute break. Do you have a lecture after 3 30? Is this the first time you are learning uh, balance of payment? As of those who have done uh, A levels, economics in A levels, uh, you should be familiar with this. Okay, let's take a break. Thank <laughs> you.
This session is uh, part two of session number eight, and this is on foreign exchange market and determination of exchange rates. And this is the coverage that we will uh, be discussing in this session: exchange rate, market, foreign exchange market, importance of exchange rate, types of foreign exchange transactions. Uh, real exchange rate, exchange rate systems, nominal and real effective exchange rate. Exchange rate market is also called as forex or FX market. It's a global decentralized marketplace. There is no any physical marketplace for this. Uh, uh, but uh, the markets are linked through electronically, electronic modes. And that is where individuals, firms, financial institutions, and government buy and sell foreign currency, buy and sell foreign exchange. It operates 24 hours, 24 hours and uh, seven days. And it is considered as the largest market and also the most liquid market in the world. The market facilitates international trade and investment by including currency conversion and helps businesses to hedge against the risk of currency fluctuation. Hedge means, uh, hedging means taking some uh, precautionary actions to avoid uh, risks coming from uh, exchange rate fluctuation. 
The foreign exchange market is not centralized in one location. Instead, uh, they are connected electronically. Major financial centers, centers like London, New York, Tokyo, and Sydney, uh, they are kind of hubs in foreign exchange market. Exchange rates, I think we introduced these two concepts in the previous session, direct quotation and indirect quotation. A simple foreign exchange rate is price of one currency. Price of one currency in terms of another currency. It's simply like a price of a commodity. It's simply like a price of a commodity. Price of Sri Lankan rupee, price of one Sri Lankan rupee in terms of USD. In terms of USD, let's say one LKR. Equals 0 0.002 USD. This is the price of Sri Lankan rupees in terms of USD. If one LKR becomes 0 0.003 USD, then what happens to the price of what has happened to the price of LKR? Price of LKR has increased. Price of LKR has increased. That is, now LKR is more valuable. LKR is more valuable. That is an appreciation in LKR, appreciation of LKR. When one currency appreciates, the other currency in the exchange rate depreciates. The other currency in uh, the exchange rate depreciates. So here it's the exchange rate between LKR and USD. When LKR appreciates, USD depreciates. USD depreciates. That means the value of one USD falls. Value of one USD falls. So this is about the value of one LKR. It has increased. So find the amount of one USD in terms of LKR in both these uh, situations. Here one USD should be equal to uh, let's say 500, 500 LKR. The second case, one USD equals uh, 3,333 LKR. So what has happened to the price of LKR, the USD? Price of USD has Price of USD has fallen. Price of USD has fallen. Here, price of LKR has increased. Price of USD has decreased. So that is why we say, when we are talking about the exchange rate between two currencies, when one currency is appreciated, the other currency depreciates. When one currency appreciates, the other currency depreciates. That is has, that has happened here. So both are both planes are the same. Both uh, types of this exchange rate and this exchange rate give the same information. Give the same information. These two exchange rates are the same. These two exchange rates are the same. So but the same exchange exchange rate in two different ways. The same exchange rate in two different ways. That is called Direct quotation and indirect quotation. Direct quotation and indirect quotation. If we say like uh, one USD equals 3,333 uh, USD, sorry, one USD equals uh, 3,333 LKR. 
This is the direct quotation. This is the direct quotation. Number of units of home currency, that is LKR per one unit of foreign currency. One unit of foreign currency. The same thing can be written as 0 0.003 USD per LKR. These two exchange rates give the same information. They are the same. They are the same, but in two different ways. This is the direct quotation. This is the indirect quotation. Indirect quotation is what? Number of units of the foreign currency, number of units of the foreign currency per one unit of home currency, per one unit of home currency. So simply exchange rate is the price of one currency in terms of another currency. It has two uh, definitions. One is direct quotation and indirect quotation. When we express the exchange rate uh, in this way, number of units of home currency per one unit of foreign currency, that is called direct quotation. So this is the direct quotation of LKR and USD. Indirect quotation is number of units of foreign currency per one unit of home currency. So this is in indirect quotation. Uh, I already explained this. When uh, USD uh, is getting spent, when USD uh, spends, its price increases in terms of LKR. Its price in terms of LKR increases so the price of you one usd has increased so here usd has strengthened on the other hand you can see the price of lkr price of lkr has reduced has reduced so lkr has weakened here the other way uh, the opposite has happened usd has weakened usd has weakened because the price of one USD has dropped, LKR has strengthened. LKR has strengthened because the price of one LKR has increased from 0 0.005 USD to 0 0.006 USD. Uh, importance of exchange rate uh, for uh, exchange rate is particularly important for small open economies like Sri Lanka because. Sri Lanka has less uh, power in the international market. Uh, exchange rate is very important in that sense. Uh, because uh, when exchange rates uh, fluctuate, when exchange rates uh, are highly fluctuating, when exchange rates are highly fluctuating, that directly affects uh, to foreign exchange inflows and outflows of the Sri Lanka. Of Sri Lanka. Uh, of so all over the countries like Sri Lanka. A country's export depends on purchasing power of the rest of the world and price competitiveness of goods and services it exports. So when the price of goods and services exported by Sri Lanka is low compared to uh, the goods and services produced in other countries, the other products become price competitive. Our products become price competitive. Then uh, our exports, our exports will increase. On the other hand, uh, the country's import depend on the purchasing power of local residents and the price competitiveness of imported goods and services. So imported means, imported goods and services means goods and services produced abroad. Goods and services produced abroad. When goods and services produced abroad, uh, are of lower prices than in domestic goods and services, than uh, the price of goods and domestic goods and services. What happens is uh, foreign goods and services, foreign goods and services become cheaper for Sri Lankans. So Sri Lankans will import a lot of uh, goods and services produced abroad. In that case, imports will go up. Imports will go up because Foreign goods and services are price competitive in that case because they are cheaper. When uh, domestically produced goods and services are cheaper compared to goods and services produced abroad, uh, imports 
מיר גובה, בין גודס אנד סרוויסס פרדיוס אפלורד, have lower prices than goods and services produced locally, imports will go up, imports will go up. When domestic currency depreciates, the price of domestic currency in terms of a foreign currency is getting lower. That is why we say it's depreciating. Let's say uh, one LKR, Earlier it was 0.002 USD. Now it is 0.003 USD. Sorry, 0.001 USD. Earlier it was 0, 0, 0, 0.003. Now it is 0, 0, 0.002 USD. So the price of LKR has fallen. The price of LKR has fallen. That means uh, LKR has depreciated. LKR has depreciated against USD. In this case, what happens? What happens? Value of LKR has fallen. As a result, the value of Sri Lankan goods and services also fall. The value of goods and services produced in Sri Lanka also will fall. Because of this depreciation, price of Sri Lankan goods and services also will fall. Will fall. As a result, what happens? What happens? Sri Lankan products become cheaper. Sri Lankan products become cheaper for foreigners. Then what happens? Foreigners will, foreigners will demand more Sri Lankan goods, more Sri Lankan goods. As a result, exports will go up, exports will go up. <coughs> On the other hand, when Sri Lankan rupee depreciated, when Sri Lankan rupee depreciates, on the other hand, what happens to USD? USD appreciates. When you LKR depreciate, USD appreciates. USD appreciate. That means price of goods and services produced in the US, price of goods and services produced in the US will go up, will go up for Sri Lankans, for Sri Lankans. Therefore, Sri Lankans find US products more expensive. US, uh, Sri Lankan customers, Sri Lankan residents find the goods and services produced in the US more expensive, more expensive. Therefore, what happens is Sri Lankan residents will demand less of US products, less of US products. Therefore, imports will go down, imports will go down from the US, from the US. So because of this domestic currency depreciation, two things happen, exports go up, imports go down. At the same time, another thing happened, what, what is it? Price of local, locally produced goods and services in Sri Lanka decreases. Price of locally produced goods and services decreases as a result of this LKR depreciation. Then what happens is, Sri Lankan residents by themselves will demand locally produced goods and services rather than import, rather than consuming imported goods and services. Domestic residents will consume domestically produced goods and services which are not targeting international market. They will stop consuming imported goods. They will move to, they will move to domestic products. Domestically produced goods and services. Even though those domestically produced goods and services are not targeted to international markets, but because of this reduction in locally produced goods and services uh, products, and also because of uh, the rise in US products, the rise in price of US products, domestic 
customers, domestic residents will move from imports, to, will move from important items to imported goods and services to domestically produced goods and services, even though these domestically produced goods and services are not for international market, not for the international market. That means at the higher at the higher import prices will reduce the purchasing power of domestic customers. Domestic producers, domestic producers who are not targeting the international market, who are not producing for the international market. Domestic producers will benefit from becoming more competitive against imports. This would lead to substitution of imports through increased domestic production. Customers, local customers, Sri Lankan customers will demand domestically produced goods and services rather than demanding imported items. Therefore, what happens is domestic industries will produce more goods and services. So, domestic uh, producers will produce more and more goods and services because now local people demand more of them rather than demanding imported items that happens. Therefore, exchange rate, exchange rate serves, serves as a mean, as a mean or as a signal, as a signal to allocate resources between those goods and services that can be traded internationally and those that sold only in the domestic market. So because of this domestic currency depreciation, one thing happened, what is it? Domestic producers, those who are targeting international markets, will face higher demand. Export demand will increase. Also, domestic producers who are not targeting the international market will also face a higher demand, so their production also will increase. Their output level also will increase. So these happen. These happen. Because of exchange rate depreciation, exchange rate depreciation. So exchange rate depreciation serves to allocate resources between those goods and services that can be traded internationally and those that are sold only in the domestic market. So because of domestic currency depreciation, demand for exports will go up, and also local demand. Uh, for locally produced goods and services will increase. So resources will be allocated mostly into these industries. Resources will be allocated mostly to these industries. And that signal comes from, and that signal comes from the domestic currency depreciation. So investors, investors will invest in local industries and also export oriented industries because both industries have higher demand. Both industries have higher demand. So investors receive that signal. Investors receive that signal from foreign currency depreciation. So domestic currency depreciation. So likewise, domestic currency appreciations and depreciations will provide signals to investors and investors will follow those signals and will allocate the resources to industries according to those signals. This is only one example where we have taken a foreign currency depreciation. When foreign currency appreciates, the opposite will happen. Investors will, will take investments away from these industries because when for domestic currency appreciates, ex, uh, export demand will fall, and also domestic demand, uh, do, the, the domestic production of domestic industries will decrease. So that will happen in, when domestic currency appreciates. The opposite to this. Opposite to this. 
uh, exchange rate is also important because it influences uh, foreign investment. Also, it influences remittances, worker remittances, and reserve position of a country. You can read these things alone. I'm not going to explain them. Uh, types of foreign uh, exchange transactions. There are two main types of foreign exchange transactions: port transaction and uh, forward transaction. Forward transaction. Port transaction happens immediately. Port transaction happens immediately. Here, yeah, immediately means not just now. Immediately implies within two business days. Immediately means within two business days. A spot transaction in the foreign exchange market is a type of trade of currencies in which uh, currencies are exchanged at the current market rate. So currencies, let's say LKR and USD, LKR and USD, are exchanged at the current market rate, at the current market rate. And currencies are exchanged Currencies are exchanged immediately. Immediately. That means generally within two working days, two business days. The exchange rate used in a spot transaction is the spot trade. So the current market rate is the spot trade. Is the spot trade. So here is here how it happens. A trader, a foreign currency trader called another trader and asked for the price of a currency, let's say US, let's say uh, LKR trader, LKR trader wants US, uh, one trader, one trader who has LKR, who has LKR needs, needs USD from uh, second trader who has USD. The first trader has LKR, the second trader has USD. The first trader wants USD. First trader wants USD. And in turn, first trader will give LKR to the second trader. That is what here happens. And first trader calls to the second trader and asks for the price. Ask for the price of currency, the current exchange rate. And the second trader provides uh, the first trader with the price that is the exchange rate both buying and selling when the traders agree to do the business one will send usd so uh, second trader will send usd to first trader in the exchange of lkr uh, by conversion the payment is actually made within two days yes, within two days that means immediately that is how a spot exchange transaction happens. The other form of foreign exchange transaction is forward transaction. Here what happens is foreign exchange market is a financial contract between two parties uh, to exchange a specified amount of one currency, a specified amount of one currency for another currency, for another currency at a predetermined predetermined exchange rate on a future date. This happens not immediately. This doesn't happen immediately. Also, this doesn't happen at the current exchange rate, not at the spot rate, the spot exchange rate. Instead, in forward contract, forward transactions, uh, the transaction will happen in future day, not within two days, not within two business days. Instead, it will happen in a future on a future day. That means beyond two days, beyond two working days. It can be in several months or in one year, like that. And also the transaction will happen on a future day at a predetermined exchange rate, not at the current uh, exchange rate that will exit on this date, on this future date. 
Instead, the transaction will happen at a predetermined exchange rate rather than at the spot rate, at the spot rate which will exit, which will exit on this future rate. So that is the rate of forward transaction. For example, let's consider this example. Uh, in August, uh, a Sri Lankan importer may arrange uh, for a shipment of Japanese cars to arrive in October. So the country, the, the, the contract occurs in August between a Sri Lankan importer and a Japanese exporter of cars. And that uh, stock of cars will arrive uh, in Sri Lanka in October. In October. So the actual uh, shipment will happen in October. The agreement with the Japanese manufacturer may call for a payment in yen on October. And Japanese exporter, Japanese exporter, Japanese car exporter wants money on this date, on this date, on October 20. To protect against the possibility of yen, let's say, let's say, uh, Sri Lankan importer, Sri Lankan importer predicts that yen will appreciate in future. Yen will appreciate in future. That means the price of yen, price of yen in terms of LKR, in terms of LKR, will go up, will go up in future will go up in future. That is the prediction of uh, the Sri Lankan importer. Is it beneficial for Sri Lankan importer? If actually this happens, if actually this happens in future, is it beneficial for the Sri Lankan importer? No. Sri Lankan importer predict that yen will appreciate. Yen will appreciate. That means the price of yen in terms of LKR will go up will go up in future. It's not beneficial for the Sri Lankan importer. So to avoid that disadvantage, to avoid that disadvantage, what happens is Sri Lankan importer enter into a forward transaction, enter into a forward contract and decide, it decide a predetermined exchange rate, which will be kind of lower, kind of lower than that will happen actually in the future. To protect against possibility of yens becoming more expensive in terms of LKR, the Sri Lankan importer might contract with the bank, contract with the bank to buy yen at a stipulated exchange rate. Yes, Sri Lankan importer is a resident in Sri Lanka. He doesn't keep yen always. When a transaction happens, uh, the Sri Lankan importer has to go to a bank and ask for yen. Ask for yen. So. Rather than waiting for the payment day, rather than waiting for the pay, payment day, in advance, uh, the importer goes to a bank and enters into a forward contract to buy yen at the predetermined exchange rate on the transaction day. That is what happens in forward transaction. So uh, when this day comes, when this day comes, the Sri Lankan importer will buy yen from the bank at that predetermined exchange rate. At that predetermined exchange rate. A forward transaction will protect persons or firms against unfavorable movements in the exchange rate, but will not allow gains. Yes. Sometimes, even though this is, uh, even though this Sri Lankan importer predicts, uh, and appreciation in LKR, appreciation in yen, this might not happen. Actually, yen might have, yen may be decreasing. The, the price of yen may be decreasing. That means yen is, uh, yen will be depreciating. Yen will be depreciating. But, uh, let's say, uh, the Importer, Sri Lankan importer predicts that in future uh, one yen will be one yen will be uh, three point 
5 LKR. This is the prediction. So to avoid this higher uh, price of yen that will happen in future, the importer, Sri Lankan importer, enters into, a, into an agreement with the Sri Lankan bank to buy yen at 3.3 LKR. Exchange rate is one. This is the predetermined exchange rate under the forward contract. Under the forward contract. This is the prediction. This is the prediction. This can happen or cannot happen. This may happen or may not happen. This is just a prediction. It's a prediction. But actually, by the time of October, actual exchange rate of yen will be 3.2.5 yen. 2.5 LKR. 2.5 LKR. So this is more beneficial for the importer. If if uh, the Sri Lankan importer can buy one yen at uh, 2.5 LKR, this is the best. This is the best. But already, already, a Sri Lankan importer has entered into a forward contract to buy one yen at 3.3 LKR. So. Will bank allow to buy one LK one yen at 2.5? No. Bank will not allow to do this for the importer, for the Sri Lankan importer. Definitely, the Sri Lankan importer has to buy one yen at this at this forward contract rate. The Sri Lankan importer will not be able to buy one yen at 2.5 LKR, even though this may be this will be the actual exchange rate in October. 20. That's why it says it protects firms or people against unfavorable movement, but it will not allow people or firms to gain or to profit from uh, foreign export forward contracts. So they have to stick. They have to stick to the contract. Forward transactions differ from spot transactions in their maturity date is more than two days, two business days. Notice that in the forward transaction, the buyer and seller are locked, locked, uh, locked into a contract. So they are the, the both parties have to stick, stick uh, to the contract at a fixed exchange rate. At a fixed exchange rate. That will not change. The fixed exchange rate will not change. Whether uh, whatever the fluctuations happen in uh, the exchange rate in future. So this is the next section, which is about the real exchange rate. Real exchange. Uh, so far we talked about nominal exchange rate. All of these concepts are nominal exchange rates. These are nominal exchange rates. The exchange rate observed actually in websites of banks, websites of central bank. When you are when you visit a bank, a commercial bank branch, you will see a notice board displaying uh, the current exchange rates. They are nominal exchange rate. So usually, what we are referring to is nominal exchange rate. Real exchange rate is a different concept. Real exchange rate is a different concept. Concept. It measures. It measures the purchasing power. It measures the purchasing power. Purchasing power of one currency in terms of another currency. So E is a simple E stands for nominal exchange rate. It's epsilon. Epsilon. Simple epsilon stands for real exchange rate. Real exchange rate. Here, for the explanation purpose, I'm using indirect quotation. For the explanation purpose, I'm using the indirect quotation. That means uh, the price of one domestic currency unit, one LKR, in terms of the price of uh, a foreign currency. Using the 
So consider this example here only to explain uh, the meaning of uh, nominal for the real exchange rate. I'm considering only one good. I'm considering only one good. That is only for the explanation purpose. Let's say uh, uh, the exchange rate between LPR and yen. Uh, the nominal exchange rate is nominal exchange rate is one LPR equals zero point five a. And the product is T-shirt. Product is a T-shirt. The same T-shirt can be purchased in Sri Lanka and in Japan in both locations. Price of the T-shirt in Japan is six thousand yen. Six thousand yen. The same T-shirt can be purchased in Sri Lanka at a price of three thousand LKR. And what is what is uh, the real exchange rate here? The formula is real exchange rate equals nominal exchange rate multiplied by the domestic price level divided by the foreign price level. P stands for the domestic price level. P star stands for the uh, foreign price level. So this is uh, the nominal exchange rate multiplied by local price. Local price 3000, LKR 3000, divided by the foreign price 6000 yen. So, this is the formula. It's simple. So, when you convert this 3000 LKR by the exchange rate, what is the result? What is the result? Result is a yen amount. Result is the yen amount. So, 0 0.5 yen, 0 0.5 yen. Multiplied by 3000 LKR, it is equivalent to it is equivalent to 1500 yen. 1500 yen. That is in the numerator. In denominator, we have only 6000 yen. So 5000 uh, 1500 yen divided by 6000 yen. The ratio is one over four. One over four. What does it indicate? What does it indicate? It indicates that. A Japanese t shirt costs four Sri Lankan t shirts. Japanese t shirt costs four Sri Lankan t shirts. Because we can buy one t shirt in Japan, one t shirt in Japan for 6,000 yen. For 6,000 yen. By spending the same amount of 6,000 yen from Sri Lanka, from Sri Lanka, the customer can buy four t-shirts. Because in Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, the same t-shirt costs only 1,500 yen. 1,500 yen. In Japan, the t-shirt costs 6,000 yen. 6,000 yen. The same. Same T-shirt in Sri Lanka in yen in yen is one thousand five hundred yen. So if you spend six thousand yen in Japan, how many T-shirts you can buy in Japan? One, one. If you spend the same amount, if if you spend the same amount in Sri Lanka, how many T-shirts you, you can buy? Four, four. That is why it says one Japanese T-shirt costs four Sri Lankan T-shirts and. Also, we can say the same thing we can say in the other way around. On the other way around, uh, a Sri Lankan t shirt costs one fourth of Japanese t shirts. If you spend an equivalent amount of 1,500 yen in Sri Lanka to buy a t shirt, how many t shirts you can buy in Japan? Only a quarter. Only a quarter. You can buy only this part, the t shirt in Japan. So that is why it's that is why it's safe. The Sri Lankan t shirt costs uh, one fourth of Japanese t shirts. So this is only about uh, one product. This is introduced just to explain the concept. Uh, real exchange rate uh, shows the purchasing power, shows the purchasing power of currencies. So here, Purchasing power of products. Purchasing power of products. In this example, there is only one good. So the real exchange rate is the relative price of one good. Price one 
country's output in terms of the other country's output. In real world, we deal with a, a, a large range of, a huge range of goods and services. Therefore, in real world, how do we calculate uh, the real exchange rate? In real world, we calculate the real exchange rate in this way. Nominal exchange rate between two currencies multiplied by domestic price level, domestic price level divided by foreign price level, foreign price level. Usually these are the CPI values, CPI, consumer price indices. CPI in uh, Sri Lanka divided by CPI in Japan. If we are talking about the exchange rate between LKR and yen, this is uh, amount of yen. Sorry, yes, amount of yen. Uh, one LKR multiplied by CPI in Sri Lanka divided by CPI in Japan. We multiply by CPI in uh, Sri Lanka and divide by CPI in Japan because we are using the indirect code. Because we are using the indirect code. If we are using the direct code, if we are using the direct code, then nominal exchange rate equal. Uh, so real exchange rate equals nominal exchange rate in direct code. This is in indirect code. Multiplied by price in uh, the price level uh, in the foreign country divided by price level in Sri Lanka. If we express the exchange rate like this way, amount of LKR per one yen. If this is the format we are following to express uh, the exchange rate. We have to multiply by price of Japan, price level of Japan, and divide by price level in Sri Lanka. Not this, okay. the other way around should be applied here. So if you are following indirect code, you have to multiply by the price level in Sri Lanka divided by price level in uh, the foreign country. If you are using uh, the direct code, you have to change the denominator and the numerator. So it implies the relative price of one country output in terms of other countries output. In real world, we think real exchange rate as the relative price of uh, a basket of domestic goods in terms of a basket of uh, foreign goods. Because when we are calculating the CPI, we are talking about a basket rather than we need to one product. We are talking about a basket of commodities because we want to represent the general price level through the CPI. So you can easily calculate uh, the real exchange rates. I have shown uh, the calculation. I have given the answers also. Please contact me if you uh, have any doubts regarding uh, these calculations. Okay. Uh, this is is uh, direct, direct, uh, indirect, indirect code. So local price level divided by foreign price level. This is direct code. We have divided uh, foreign price level by local price. How next export depends on real exchange rate. Real exchange rate is about the relative price of uh, domestic commodities in terms of foreign commodities. When real exchange rate increases, sorry, when, yes, when real exchange rate increases, what does it mean? What does it mean? Does it mean domestic products uh, 
domestic products are relatively expensive compared to compared to foreign products. Nominal exchange rate is about price between two, two currencies. Nominal exchange rate is about price of one currency in terms of another currency. Real exchange rate is about price of goods domestically produced in terms of price of goods produced abroad. That is about relative prices of goods and services, not about price of currencies. In nominal exchange rate, we talk about price of currencies. In real exchange, we talk about price of commodities, price of goods and services. So when nominal exchange rate, sorry, real exchange rate increases, what happens is domestic products are relatively expensive. The price of domestic products are relatively higher compared to foreign products. Therefore, domestic products are relatively expensive compared to foreign products. Then what happens? What happens? Exports will fall. Imports will increase. Sorry, imports will increase. These two changes happen. Domestically produced goods and services are expensive. Will foreigners buy our product? Will foreigners buy our product? No. Exports will fall. Domestic products are expensive. Foreign products are cheaper. So what happens? What will what will do? Uh, what residents do? Residents will, local residents will import foreign products. Therefore, imports will go up. So these two things will happen when real exchange rate increases. When real exchange rate decreases, real exchange rate decreases, domestic products become relatively cheaper, cheaper compared to foreign products. In that case, exports will go up, imports will go down. So these are the changes that will happen. So what kind of relationship is there between real exchange rate and uh, net exports? When real exchange rate increases, when real exchange rate increases, export falls, import increases, then Net export will go down. When real exchange rate decreases, exchange increases, import decreases. As a result, net export, net export will increase. So what kind of relationship is there between uh, real exchange rate and net export? There is a negative relationship. There is an inverse relationship. They behave to the opposite direction. When one variable increases, the other variable decreases. When one variable decreases, the other variable decreases. So there is an inverse relationship or a negative relationship. So net export is inversely related to, net, uh, to the uh, real exchange rate. Net export is negatively related or inversely related to uh, the real exchange rate. Okay, that is about the relationship between net exports and uh, real exchange rate. Exchange rate systems. There are two main types of exchange rate systems. There are some other systems as well. Basically, there are two. One is floating and one is fixed. In floating exchange rate, we allow market to we allow market to determine exchange rate. So market demand for foreign currency. Market supply of foreign currency will determine uh, the market equilibrium exchange rate. When it comes to fixed exchange rate, uh, the government or the monetary authority anchors the local currency to a foreign currency. 
the government or the monetary authority and the, the local currency to a foreign currency, which is a strong foreign currency. It should be a strong foreign currency. So there are two types of exchange rate systems. Basically, there are two. There are some other as well. The one is uh, one is floating exchange rate, and the other one is fixed or pegged peg exchange rate system. Fixed exchange rate system. Uh, here, particularly small developing nations who which don't have strong currencies like Sri Lanka and some other small developing nations, their currencies are not strong. Their currencies are not strong. If it is about to collapse the currency, if it is about to collapse the currency, can you remember there were uh, rumors like uh, the Sri Lanka government is going to pay LKR to Indian rupees? Can you remember such news going on media? During the crisis, Lanka will be the uh, India will be the peg currency not here, and the currency not here. So that is what happens when a currency of a small developing nation is weakening, weakening, collapsing. Uh, such currencies can be pegged or anchored to strong currency, to strong currencies. Strong currencies are the key currencies are widely traded. In world money market and also uh, which are stable over time, they are stable over time and also they are widely accepted currencies. So, for example, USD, USD, some poor countries, developing countries who are facing uh, recessions and who are facing uh, high inflation, very high inflation, they can pick their local currencies to strong currencies like the USD. I'm not going to explain these things in detail. You can read them for your knowledge. To maintain a fixed exchange rate, it requires an exchange stabilization fund. When there is some excess demand or excess supply of foreign exchange, uh, the monetary authority can release foreign exchange or can uh, uh, get foreign exchange from the market. Uh, to a fund called Exchange Stabilization Fund. Under foreign exchange, uh, under fixed exchange rate system, we don't use the terms depreciation and appreciation. Instead, we use the terms devaluation and revaluation. Devaluation is something like similar to depreciation. We purposefully reduce the price of the domestic currency. That is called uh, devaluation. The monetary authority purposefully reduces uh, the value of the local currency that is called devaluation. If the monetary authority purposefully increases the value of the local currency, that is called revaluation. So they are counterparts of depreciation and appreciation in the floating exchange rate. Depreciation and appreciation are the two terms we use in a floating exchange rate system. Devaluation and revaluation are the two terms we use in uh, a fixed exchange rate system. So we in this is about floating exchange rate, the second system. Uh, there is no restriction uh, imposed by the government. Equilibrium exchange rate is determined uh, when uh, the demand for foreign exchange and supply of foreign exchange are intersecting. This is uh, the supply of let's say we are talking about. LKR USD extended. This is supply of USD. This is uh, demand for USD. This is the, uh, the quantity of USD traded. Quantity of USD traded. And this is, let's say we are using uh, the direct code amount of LKR uh, per one USD. So this is the equilibrium exchange rate. Equilibrium exchange. And we use the terms appreciation and depreciation here. We allow the exchange rate to adjust freely in response to the changes in demand and supply of foreign exchange. And here, uh, 
under the fixed exchange rate system, we have to use we have to uh, use the exchange stabilization fund, which is in terms of foreign exchange or foreign currency, like foreign reserves. But in the floating exchange rate, we don't have to utilize uh, foreign reserves or international reserves in order to uh, stabilize the foreign exchange market because it automatically happens. It automatically happens. The, the market reaches the equilibrium automatically. Monetary authorities do not want to use international reserves for the purpose of intervening in the intervening in the market to maintain the exchange rate. So there are several advantages. Uh, they respond quickly. They respond quickly to the changes in demand and supply conditions in the market. And uh, the balance of payment uh, is equilibrium are automatically adjusted if there is a balance of payment surplus or balance of payment deficit they are automatically adjusted so that is another advantage but there are several disadvantages as well uh, there will be huge fluctuations there will be huge fluctuations in currencies and they are not good for the economy because uh, investors will face problems in making decisions when uh, the, the exchange rate is highly, hugely fluctuating, it's not uncertain. So it's not certain. The, the environment is very uncertain. So investors will face a difficult situation in making their investment decisions when the exchange rates are highly fluctuating. And also uh, when uh, a foreign currency, when the local inflation is very high, when, uh, let's say, Sri Lankan inflation rate is very high, what happens? What happens? Let's say we talk about USA and Sri Lanka. Uh, the inflation rate in Sri Lanka is very high compared to the US inflation rate. So it motivates Sri Lankan consumers to demand US goods more and more. Sri Lankan uh, customers, Sri Lankan residents will demand US products more and more. That's what happens. Demand for uh, import, demand for US imports will increase. Demand for US imports will increase. In exchange rate, what happens? In exchange, uh, in exchange market, what happens? Demand for USD, demand for USD will increase. Demand for USD will increase and exchange rate in uh, direct court, exchange rate in direct court increases. That means uh, one USD, one USD will be priced higher. One USD will be priced higher. That means LKR depreciates, LKR depreciates and USD appreciates, USD appreciates. When LKR depreciates, what happens again? What happens again? If Sri Lanka is importing price inelastic commodities like fuel, most of uh, necessary consumables, anyway, whatever the price, they have to import those items. Well, whatever the price, Sri Lanka has to import from other countries. Uh, food items like sugar, if the domestic production is not sufficient. Anyway, Sri Lanka has to import them. So such items are price inelastic. So if a country has price inelastic demand for imports, whatever the price, whatever the price, they have to import them. So let's say Sri Lanka is importing price inelastic items from the USA. So anyway, they have to, Sri Lanka has to pay for them. Sri Lanka has to import them. So they have to pay for them. So since USD has increased, Sri Lanka has to pay a higher amount of USD, higher values of USD for imports now because USD has increased. At the same time, Sri Lanka is importing price inelastic items from uh, the USA, which are very necessary for the economy. Therefore, import 
कॉस्ट इंपोर्ट कॉस्ट विल इंक्रीज इन श्रीलंका अगेन वॉट एपन्स अगेन वॉट एपन्स इज इट विल क्रिएट एन इंफ्लेशन इन डोमेस्टिक इकोनॉमी एंड यूएस इंपोर्ट्स आर हाईली 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 प्राइस्ड when us imports are uh, priced highly then they have to be sold they have to be sold in the domestic market at higher prices as well so it accelerates the inflation in sri lanka it accelerates inflation in sri lanka which cause continuous inflation persistent inflation in the economy which will continuously depreciate the domestic currency so it will continuously happen because sri lanka is importing necessary items from the us anyway sri lanka has to import them from the us us uh, b us dollars has appreciated so the price of us imported uh, price of imported commodities from us are very high since they are uh, highly priced they have to be sold at higher prices in sri lanka as well that will accelerate that will accelerate inflation in uh, the domestic economy which will lead to continuous depreciation which will lead to continuous depreciation of lpr so that is also problematic this this vicious cycle it's kind of a vicious cycle the cycle doesn't stop it continuously creates inflation and continuously uh, the local currency depreciates the cycle will continue uh, For considerable period of time, that is also disadvantageous to the economy, and this happens because uh, the economy follows. Economy has adapted a floating exchange rate. So these are the uh, uh, reasons for uh, demand. Uh, reasons. Uh, these are the forces for the demand of foreign exchange. These are the forces for the supply of foreign exchange. you can read them out i mean i think i explained several things uh, in previous previous this this slides i have already explained in the previous session you can refer to them effective exchange rate we have only time here effective exchange rate You want to learn this? <laughs> of this session, of this session, I will check your knowledge on. I will check your knowledge on. The real exchange rate. I will check your knowledge on real exchange rate. And knowledge on forward and spot transactions. Forward and spot transactions. and uh, the two exchange rate systems two exchange rate system floating exchange rate system and uh, fixed or bet exchange rate system that's enough and practice that sum i gave in uh, the assignment the, the individual assignment take home assignment there will be a similar question in the final exam at least six several times and you don't have to refer to any textbook it all i will uh prepare questions only from the content i discuss in the class not from some ielts i will give questions only from the content we discuss so then that you know,
Any questions? similar questions lecture open I 
ਮਾਰਕਟ ਦਾ ਨਾਮ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਇੰਡੀਵਿਜੂਅਲ ਅਸੈਸਮੈਂਟ ਦੇ ਮਾਰਕਸ